every one of us in our life are in, always in different stages and different places and different planes where we're, we're living our life and so many things are going on and we meet here on Sunday mornings and many times not even realizing what's really happening in a, another member's life or what's going on. And so it's good to get in here and just worship together. And I think one of the greatest things that we can do and honor the Lord in our life is obviously Sunday morning come together and worship the Lord. And then to have a time where we're encouraged by the Word of God and we allow the Spirit of God to take His Word and teach us and instruct us. This is a series that we're in. In fact, this is the third of the messages called Destiny Dynamics, Discovering or the Principles for Discovering God's Will. Really, you could even do a little, even more along the lines of discovering God in your life because these are important principles that we've been going through in Scripture that teach us how we can understand, I think, as much as anything else, the ways of God. Now, we're calling it the destiny dynamics, but if you're not familiar with this terminology of dynamics, Webster puts it this way. It's something that is the underlying cause for change or growth. Uh, if you just look at life in general, there are dynamics that are in operation in everything. There were dynamics in the music they played today. There's dynamics in physics and math. There's In all areas of science, there's dynamics. Even in meteorology, there's dynamics. We talk about what you do in your personal life. There are things that, you know, the, there's dynamics when you go to drive to work tomorrow morning. The, all these things that create change or try to impose change. Now, we've talked about it in the spiritual context, in our spiritual life, that there are certain things that are in operation. There's just dynamics. Obviously, we dealt with last week the God dynamic, amen? And if you don't become familiar with God and know God and understand who he is on some level of what the Bible teaches us and that he's manifest through the life of Jesus Christ, then you're never really going to know the will of God. I mean, big point last week is if you don't know God, you're going to have a difficult time in understanding God's purposes and God's will. We have discovered that when we give our lives to Christ, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says we do that by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 10 says, but we are his workmanship. Now that we're saved by grace through faith, not of our own works, God has created us for some things, his purpose and his will. He's created us for good works. And literally, it means that God has a purpose for your life and God has a plan for your life. And he wants you to, to discover that and he wants you to fulfill what that is. In fact, it says in Ephesians 2.10 that he preordained a plan Long before you were born, before I was born, God had a plan for my life. And he knew in his sovereignty and his grace that Joe Arms was going to be in this world. And he planned him and he formed him in his mother's womb just as he did you. And he had a purpose for your life. Every day that you're apart from God, is an, is more likely you'll never discover that purpose that he has for your life. Get connected to him. Understand that he has a purpose and a plan. Understand the way that he desires to know you is first and foremost by cleansing you of your sin through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and giving you a brand new life. And if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. The Bible says, and all things are of God. God has something God-like for your life. Amen? God has something that will, will literally set your life on a course that, is, that you will find great satisfaction and purpose in. Most people I have met through my life, if you really want to boil it down to what are they looking for, I think most people in life are looking for significance. What's the meaning? What's the purpose? What am I here for? So that's why we're doing this particular series as we talk about how God affects our life and the things that are in place that God will use in our life if we're going to discover that significance and understand his will for our life. Last week, as I said, we talked about the God dynamic. This week, we're going to talk about the truth dynamic and what the Bible has to say about itself even, and what God says about the Bible as it's presented to us as Christians. So we want to go to the Word to discover what that means for our life. So stand with me. We're going to read a passage of Scripture, and we'll stand in honor of the reading of the, this, the Word this morning. And this is from Second Peter, and it's chapter 1, and it's verse 2. He says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Somebody say amen to the word. Now you may be seated. You know, basically he's saying here... If you read this back again, it says, you know, grace and peace. Well, how do you find grace and peace? That's certainly what we want to experience. You're going to find it through the knowledge of God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It gets back again. If you don't know God, you don't know purpose. If you don't know God, you're not going to know life. But he says, now, by these, by this grace 
and his blessings and the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that his divine power has granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. If you ever get a bite on that verse and what that's really saying, it will certainly do away with any excuses you've been looking for. (laughs) Because what he's saying here is that God will give you everything you need to be what he's called you to be. He says he's given to us everything that pertains to, what's that first word? Life. I can get that part down, but this second part, it's hard for me until I realize where it comes from. Godliness. Anytime I try to be like God without God, it's an absolute failure. Amen? Try to live my life the way God wants me to live it without the power of God on my life, it's an absolute failure. But when I begin to understand that God's given me what I need to live this Christian life, it can be life transforming. God, I, I, can't, I can't sit back and say, well, Lord, if I just had this, and if I just had this, and if I had more money, you know, and, and if my wife would treat me nicer, or, you know, if I, if I had a better house, or I had a better job. No, you can't say any of those things when you read this verse anymore. Because God said, I've already, this is past tense. I have given unto you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Here it says it very clearly. He says, and how, how do we do this? How do we participate in this new life? Well, he tells us it's by the promises of God. How are we going to participate in all God's given me? This life, this peace, this grace, this purpose, significance of my life, it's going to be through this truth dynamic, the Word of God. Now, we've already talked about a little bit about this in relationship to what the Word of God is versus any other word that the world has to offer. The Word of God is living. The Word of God is powerful. The promises of God are true. And we'll talk about this, the power of that particular dynamic. But what he's saying here is that Jesus has already accomplished all that's necessary for a believer's salvation, and he's granted to them everything they will need through his precious and his magnificent promises. In fact, the term rendered when he said he has granted in that verse, it's the same Greek word, doremia, which occurs in verse 3, and it's in the perfect tense, which basically means it's something that he's done in the past, but the action of it continues in the present day. God granted his promises to us in the past, but they're still good today. Everything God told Peter and James and John is still valid for Joe and Bill and Sue or whoever else if they've come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Can I really take the Word of God and can I really believe the Word of God? Yes, you can. And it's not only, it is a dynamic. It will create change in your life. The Bible tells us that it transforms us, that we, we want to present our body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. That's our reasonable service of worship, Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us. And it says that we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's the power of God's Word. Jesus put it this way. Now you are clean, basically changed, transformed through the words that I have spoken unto you. That we somehow just kind of push the Bible off to the side. We don't spend time with it. We don't, we don't read it. We don't meditate on it. We don't memorize it anymore. If you've done that in your spiritual life, I can guarantee you your battery is dead. And you're just operating on pure flesh energy. And let me tell you this, you can only do that so long. It'll only last so long. The only way to recharge is get your heart and your mind plugged back into God's Word and begin to let it be a real part of your life on an everyday basis. And you will discover at that point these great, as he says, these precious promises. You'll discover this past action of the granted promises that will have a continuing effect in your life. He says these words, and he uses this word, that, that we may become, all right? He's granted us these promises that we may become partakers of the divine nature. Listen, when he says that to us, that means that's a certain reality, a present certainty. Even though it was something that's done in the past, and talks about a future possibility, it's for the present tense. That right now, God can do something in my life through His Word, which is supernatural, all right? It's spiritual. It's not fleshly. It's not to be understood with the carnal mind. It's a supernatural and a spiritual Word. That if I learn how to begin to just believe what God says, then I can have a present certainty that God's going to be showing me His will and His purposes and His plan, and I'm going to be being transformed, and I'm going to be being more like Jesus in my life. And listen, I know there's a lot yet to go. I don't know about you, but, you know, He didn't have much to work with with me to start with. How about you? 
Uh, anybody here really think when you really understood what it meant in, 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 and what it went to be a sinner and what God's grace really was, that you really had something to offer God? When we get a pure glimpse of ourselves and how far we are separated from God and just how meaningless life is without God in our life, then we just realize, you know, there's not a whole lot to work with. Some of us got it. <laughs> I know you well, Brother Joe, you're insulting me. Listen, we're an insult to God until we get right with God. Amen? And so it, it's kind of like the, the old, you know, somebody said about, it was it, you know, when Michelangelo was doing the great statue of David, does, you know, and he's chipping away at the marble, and he said, how are you going to get that out of there? And what, how, do you, how do you come up with such a magnificent statue? And he says, you know, I just chip away anything that doesn't look like David, you know? Well, isn't that what God's doing in our life? But how does that happen? It happens through the Word because the Word, James says, is like a mirror. The word that James says is like, not only will it mirror what we are, it'll help us see who he is. And the more that we look at him, then the more we're transformed. But hey, I don't know about you, there's been a lot of chipping going on in my life. And there's present day chipping as well. But he's given me everything that I need to be what he's called me to be. Let that soak in. Let that just fill your heart and mind for a moment. That is one of the most tre tremendous and terrific and incredible forces, dynamic that is working in your life. In fact, he describes them as precious and magnificent promises, meaning they are valuable and they are great and the greatest. There's nothing higher than this. There's nothing more powerful than this. So he's telling us that we may become like him as a certainty. So he tells us the saints have received everything related to life and godliness as well as the promises on top of it. And it's the promises in which we use to participate in this life and this godliness. And if we miss out on the promises of God, then we've certainly missed out on all that God has really planned for us. So you can't, let me put it that way, you have got to reevaluate and revalue the Word of God in your life. You have got to put it in the highest place because it is through the Word of God and your activity within the Word of God, that you're going to be transformed. He says we are made partakers. That's that fellowship word we use, the koinonios, which means partnership and sharing together. And he says, if you'll take my word and it will apply to your life, it'll transform your life, and you will literally share in my life. I mean, just read through the Gospel of John, how often the importance is put upon the Word of God. If you abide in my words and my words abide on you, you'll ask what you will, and it will be given to you. That's a powerful verse, is it not? How many of you are asking God for things and not getting them? Because all prayer ultimately gets back to God. All, I think God's will is what we're dealing with here. And so what we're praying is according to God's will. We're not praying according to Joe's will, your will, all right? We want God's will to be done. And as I allow the Word of God to be the dynamic in my life that God desires to be, I'm going to know what the will of God is. The more I know his word, the more I know his will. The more I know his word, the more I know his ways. And the more I know his will and his word and his ways, the more I know how to pray. I think we waste a lot of time just praying our own selfish will. And what James says, you know, you don't get what you ask for because you're just asking for your own selfish desires. And this is, this is a hard deal because it means we have to be in the word. It means we have to be discerning. It means we have to look at things no longer from what's going to make me happy, but what will glorify God in my life. But I know that's not the American culture. It's all about what makes us happy. He said that you can know the will of God so that you may become godly here and now, not just in heaven. He uses this word that we are partakers, and, and it gets to this part where we're really experiencing God in our life, that I'm walking in partnership with God. You know, my marriage is a partnership, all right? We're one. We're, we're in partnership. But do you realize my salvation is also a partnership? But how many times in my own personal life have I really just kind of relied upon my own ingenious capacities, which is non-genius for the most time, you know, to get me through my spiritual walk in life? I'm going to just kind of make it happen. I'm going to work it out. I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to pull myself. I'm just going to be positive-minded. And uh, Listen, that's not what you need. You need to fall on the grace of God. You need to fall on the power of God. You need to rest in the power of Jesus Christ. He's wanting to partner with you here. All right? He, he wants to fellowship. Isn't that what John said? This is the message that we've heard in John's first letter, you know, to the church. Isn't this the message we've heard from the beginning? That God is light and there's no darkness at all. He said, and he's called us into fellowship with him. 
It's the ministry of your whole life. Gets around this whole idea of, of just walking in fellowship with God, enjoying your fellowship with God, experiencing God on your daily life. In fellowship, that's where you're going to learn the will of God, and that's where you discover your destiny. You're not going to just be able to set God off to the side and say, I really want what's best for my life, and I want what I think will be the best thing for my life, and I want the, the best job in my life, and I want the best family in my life, and I really want this. Hey, if you leave God out of the equation and his word out of the equation, you're just going to get lost real quick. You're going to run around in spiritual circles, all right? And, and that's where many people are in our churches. A sense of purpose, a sense of direction, a sense of, of mission to, in the world, of partnering in the kingdom of God, of being a part of what God's doing in the world. They don't live with that in their head, you know? They're too busy just doing things in the world around them. But they don't live with a mindset, hey, this is, this is you know, my life's a God deal. And, I, and I'm alive by his life, and I live by his life, and I'm in partnership with him. Today. How am I going to enjoy that partnership? He's given us these precious promises. So I need to understand the promises. I need to understand the dynamic of these promises. And it's in fellowship where I'm really going to learn, one, to enjoy God, and then to enjoy God's purposes. Realize the Bible. It's filled with everything you need for everything in your life. I mean, I don't care what you'll face in your life. God's Word has an answer. There's a principle for it. There's an idea. There's something God's laid there, whether it's in your relationship, what kind of relationships you ought to have, who you ought to be in deeper fellowship with. He talks about your financial life. He talks about your marriage life. He has principles on your business life, on your church. He tells us how to, how to do church in here. He tells us how, what that means. He talks about our home. He talks about our attitudes. He talks about our health. It's all in there. What is God saying to me? What is God speaking to my heart? I have to be in the Word of God. All too often, we're content. Well, Paul rebuked the Corinthians, and he said, you know, he said, I, I'm trying to teach you a spiritual people. Because you're, once you come to Christ, you're a spiritual person. He said, but you're not, you're not moving forward. He said, in fact, you're carnal. It's like you're dwarfed in your spiritual life. You should be teaching others by now, but you're not. Why? Because they didn't understand the concept that I, this is the deal between me and God and God's will and God's purposes. It was more about, well, praise God, I'm not going to hell, so now I'm under grace, so I just go see what I can get away with. He says, you're, you're just carnally minded. He says, you need to be spiritually minded. And, so, and whenever, whenever we start l living our lives by natural thinking instead of spiritual thinking, we're going to be off target in every instance. I mean, we can even think that we're doing the right thing in our natural mind. But according to Proverbs 14, 12, it can be the wrong thing. There's a way which seems right into man, but the end of that is death. And I can say, well, this is a good decision. It's a good choice. It's the right thing to do because I logically can put all the pieces together. But if it's not God's will, it's not going to bring life. And it's not going to bring grace. And I'm not going to participate in fellowship with my heavenly Father the way he has designed for me to live in fellowship with him. I'm going to be out just doing my own thing. And my own thing may be noble, according to the world. It doesn't have to necessarily be some sinful attitude. It might be a good thing, but it's not the best thing. It's not the God thing. So we understand this morning, we talk about dynamics in our life. The Bible, it's that truth dynamic. It is the final authority in all, all matters concerning God's will for your life. In fact, it's the final authority in all things God. You know what God's like? It's in His Word. This is the divine revelation the Scripture, and it's given to us by the power of God and the grace of God. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 32 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. How does he do that? Through the word. It becomes the lamp. It's what illuminates. It, what gives, it gives clarity. It gives understanding. It gives comfort in the midst of all things. And if I understand the value of God's Word, then I will begin to plant my life, heart, mind, soul into the Word. But if the Word of God has become unimportant and unread, and not, there's not a commitment to it, then I'm not going to have that truth dynamic working in me to, to create the change and to bring spiritual maturity and to be, bring me spiritual growth. I'll continue to live by the natural mind instead of the spiritual mind. The Bible tells us when we come to Christ, we're no longer 
of the flesh. We're of the spirit. We struggle here. There's a battle every day. I have to go to the cross and die daily to the flesh, but I'm alive in my spirit. God has brought life to my spirit. He spoke about that in last week's message on the God dynamic. And now that I'm alive in my spirit, I have to nurture that new life through the word of God. And it's in God's word where I find God's will. It's in God's word where I find God. I mean, you just, you just need to approach your Bible with a whole new mindset that this is God's word. And if I open it up, it's a living word. God literally moves and walks across these pages. And he wants to take what is here and put it here so that I have clarity and understanding in my life, so that I see things differently, so I can discern things correctly, so I can understand things from a proper perspective. The Bible is so valuable to my life. It is the great, the exceeding, the precious thing of my heart and soul and life. And if I don't treat it that way and acknowledge it in my life and get serious about it in my life, I'm going to miss God completely. By the way, when we talk about this truth dynamic, how reliable is it? God will never contradict his word. All right? Psalm says it this way. I will worship towards your holy temple. I'll praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. God is saying here, I am so set on what I have written and these promises that I'm getting, I will never violate them. I would have to violate my own name, which means his character, to violate his word. And he'll never violate his word. But where's the problem come in? We would violate his word. We don't honor the word the way God has honored the word. You know, I've had people tell me all the time that, you know, that, you know, that they're just going to do something and I present, well, here's what the Bible says about it. Well, you know, I, I know what the Bible says about it, but, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. God doesn't violate his word. In fact, the Holy Spirit will not violate the word or contradict the word of God. Jesus said to the Holy Spirit in John 16, verse 13, he says, when he comes, the spirit of truth, he's the spirit of the word of God as well. He will guide you into the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you the things to come. What's he saying? The Spirit will bear witness with what God has written and will teach you what God has written. And that's one of the dynamics. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit dynamic in, in, in the days to come as we're in this series, but how the Holy Spirit impacts our life and brings truth to life to create the change in our lives, to give us the direction and the course changes of our, in the direction of our life. But if we don't see the power and the primacy and the importance of God's Word, we're certainly going to violate His Word. The Holy Spirit will not contradict the Word of God. I have somebody came to me too one time. I've had men tell me this. I've had women tell me this. I'm getting a divorce. I had somebody tell me this recently. I'm getting a divorce. I said, well, do you realize what the Bible says? Well, you know, I know what the Bible says, but I'm getting a divorce anyway. Well, do you have any meaning? Not really. I just don't like him. I'm just tired of him. You know? Now, you should know by now, hopefully, that if you decide to make that course change in your life, second chance isn't going to be much better than first chance. <laughs> people usually just continue when they ignore God repeating the same mistake over and over and over again. Did you know that? You think you're going to do it one more time, but if you do it without God, you're not going to do anything right. Well, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to you know, I know my parents told me, we'll talk about that in a moment, but I'm just going to do what I want to do. Or, you know, so-and-so hurt me, and I'm going to get even. They talked about me, so I'm going to talk about them. Well, what does the Bible have to say? Well, I know what the Bible says, but I'm not going to do what the Bible says. I'm not going to forgive them. I can never forgive them. You see the insanity of that? Basically what you're saying is I'm going to turn down any resource for healing in my life, any resource for strength in my life, any resource for hope in my life. I'm just going to take this thing in my own hands and do it the way I think is best. Well, let me tell you, let's take your brilliant mind and set up a God's omniscient mind and see what we come up with. You're going to fail. You don't have that facts. You don't have the inside information. You don't have all, you don't, you don't understand what's happening in the person next to you, much less your own self half the time. But God does. And he can be trusted. And the Holy Spirit will bring you to the truth and will teach you the truth. And if God doesn't violate his word, 
Jesus never violated the word, the Holy Spirit never violates the word, then shouldn't it be a little bit obvious that we should never violate his word? Psalms 119, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much as in all riches, I'll meditate on your precepts. I will contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. God, help us to get that in our heart. Help us to realize. If you've walked away from a time where you spend daily in the word of God, I can only encourage you and cajole you and push you and press you and teach you and preach to you, but you personally are going to have to make a a disciplined decision to say, I'm getting into the Word of God. I don't care whether it's a read-through daily or a devotional you're going through each time or or just reading a book a month of of the Bible. I mean, you can take one book a month and just, you know, just say, hey, in six years I'm going to have read the whole Bible. But that one book, just read it every day as much as possible, all right? Whether it's a chapter, two chapters, or three chapters, finish the book, and then come back. If it's week two, read it again. And every time you go through it, you're going to see something different and fresh and meaningful and real. In fact, God's going to begin to illuminate it for you to give you the change, the instruction, and his will revealed to you. This, this, is, this is where we discover God. This is the truth dynamic, all right? And it's in this truth dynamic that we begin to understand the other things that God is using in our life. When it comes to making decisions and discovering his purposes and knowing what his will is for my life. Let me tell you one simple one that comes out of the Bible. It's a clear teaching of the word of God for understanding God's purposes. They call it the authority dynamic. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is Lord. You want to know God's will? Jesus is going to have to be Lord in your life. Why? Because why should God reveal his will to me if I'm not going to do it? You know? The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord in James chapter 1. What does double-minded mean? That means I've got my mind the way Joe Arms thinks it ought to be done. And then I read what the Bible says. And I discover how God thinks it ought to be done. And I say, I think I'll do my way. Well, let me, you know, and I've had people tell me this literally. And I don't think they understand how... How ridiculous they sound when say, well, here's what I'm going to do. What do you think God wants me to do? And we open up the Bible to see what God might have spoken very clearly on that issue. And I don't think so. In other words, God, I, I want to know what your will is. And you know what? If it's not too difficult or if it fits in my plan, then I'll do it. Is Jesus really Lord? Is he in charge? Is he leading our life? Is he, is he the dynamic that's in control of us? I love how Romans puts it this way in verse 14, 9. This, to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he's who? Let's say it again. Lord. He's Lord. Now, what does that mean? I mean, Put it in simple vernacular, he's in charge. He's leading the show. He's, 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 the, he's, got, he's in control of this thing. He's the head of my life. And God has set him up as Lord. It means God has invoked his authority and given him this powerful authority as God that Jesus now is Lord. Isaiah puts it this way as he looks forward. He says, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, your Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. Listen, if you want direction, you're going to have to get right with the Lord because that's where direction comes from. You know, this isn't a, this, this deal of Christianity is, is I'm not a franchise where I can kind of get some stuff from headquarters and do the rest myself the way I want it done. All right? He owns me. The Bible says you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God owns you. He owns me. He, own, I, he owns it all. The rightful authority over your life is not you. I hate to tell you that. It's God. You live, you breathe, you have your being, as the Apostle Paul said, because of God, this invisible God. To the to the the people of Athens, they 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 had this statue of the unknown God. And he said, Let me tell you about this unknown God. And he started talking about the God of heaven. And he brings forth the message of Jesus Christ. Remember Ephesians 2:10, 2, 2, 8 and 9, saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 210, we are his workmanship. 
who is Jesus. You are Jesus' workmanship. Now, you, you, I think we've talked about this before, that word workmanship, it means that you are his project. L literally, it's a word that we, you, we get the word from a Greek word for poem. A literary masterpiece. Well, you say, I ain't much. Well, turn it over to him. He'll make, he'll make something of it. All right? You've got to realize that you are God's. And that not only are you, you God's, you are God's, but you're God's special poem. You're God's special project. You're God's special masterpiece. You're God's unique work. There's nobody, nobody, nobody like you. Nobody like me. Praise God. I'd hate to have me for a church member. <laughs> nobody like you, nobody like me. Doesn't that, doesn't that kind of stir something up in you? You realize that, well, Brother Joe, you know, I'm just, I, we aren't much in ourselves. But in Christ, in Him, as we understand what He's done for us and what He's doing in us and what He's doing with us, that we are unique and God is trying to do something in our life with this workmanship. And He goes on to say, not only is workmanship, we were recreated in Christ Jesus for something, for good works. That's His purpose. What good works? The ones that God has prepared beforehand so that we would walk in Him. What's he saying? You're special. You're unique. You're a blessing to the Father. The Father's done something real in you and valuable in you and unique in you. You need to discover him before you'll ever discover it in you. And when you begin to put your affections on things above and not on things below, you'll begin to discover the purposes and the plans and the significance in your life that God has for you. How often do we look for significance in, in things that are so fleeting and things that are so temporal? This job, that career, that nothing has... It's not about that. It's about you walking with your heavenly Father, your Creator. You are His masterpiece. You are His work. Yes, it's in progress. Yes, they're still being chipped away. Yes, there's stuff God's taken off my life all the time, every day. But praise God, I am not what I used to be. Hallelujah. I will say, I am not what I used to be. I am not. Praise God, I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm going to be. God's moving me that way. Have I failed? Yes. Thank God. I heard a preacher saying this morning, thank God for the God of the second chance. Let me put it this way. Thank God for the God of another chance, and another chance, and another chance, and another chance, and another chance. And another chance. And another chance, and you know what I mean, what I'm saying here. Don't sit on the sidelines or by the riverbank, get your toes wet, you know. Jump on in. Move forward him. Be aggressive in your approach to your father. Dive into his word. Surrender to his lordship. He is everything we need. What we have to do is just surrender. John 17, if any man is willing to do God's will... He's going to know the teaching whether something's of God or whether I'm just speaking to myself. What's he saying? You commit to God's will, God's going to show you his will. You commit yourself to God, he's going to show you his will. You commit yourself to his will, his purposes, his glory, he's going to speak to you. He's going to guide you. He's going to direct you. But if it's just still about you, you're going to miss it. It's about him and what he's doing. Let me read that from a New Living Translation. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or it's merely my own. In other words, if you're committed to his will, over and above your will, you will understand God's will. You'll begin to know what God wants. But if you're not purposed to do God's will, why waste your time? And by the way, if you're not purposed to do God's will, all you ever will do is waste your time. There's no value in your life, no real significance. So we have to ask ourselves, is my will submitted to his will? Now, I know that's contradictory to a lot of the gospel that's being preached today. The, the gospel message today has become, God loves you, doesn't want you to go to hell, just pray a prayer. I mean, that's kind of what y'all, some of y'all have heard those people around. God loves you, doesn't want you to go to hell, so just pray a prayer, and he's going to bless you. He's going to keep blessing you. Where's God in all that? It's all about you. God saves us so that we might know Him. God saves us to be brought in partnership with Him. 
and, you know, I really believe that many times as Christians, we, we treat God more like a spare tire. You know, when we get in trouble, have a blowout in life, we open the trunk, get God out. Oh, God, get me out of this. I promise I'll do whatever you want me to do. I don't know if you've ever prayed that. I have. I prayed a bunch of times before I ever got saved. I was always in trouble. <laughs> God was trying to get me to the place of brokenness in my life. So I pretty much stayed in trouble. You know, I, I tell my brother who got saved about a year before me, and he, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing miserable. He said, oh, praise God. I said, what do you mean, praise God? He said, I've been praying for you. He said, well, stop it. <laughs> God loved me enough to keep after me, and he loves you enough to keep after you, and he loves you enough to keep drawing you to himself. And so you need to come to this place that realize that God's not some emergency backup plan. He's your life, and your life will surrender around him. But we have to understand this whole principle of authority, by the way, as we talk about the authority dynamic, the Bible says that all authority comes from above. And the word there has to do with power, all right, when it talks about it. It means the, the right and the privilege. God has the right and the privilege to do anything he wants to do, right? He's God. Now, God has defined the parameters in which he'll exercise that righteous action in our life through his word. But you know that God's given you right and privilege in your life as well? But how are you going to experience authority in your life? Authority over the devil. Authority over circumstances. Authority over attitudes. Authority over emotions. Authority over your own fleshly desires. You don't have any authority until you surrender to his authority because all authority comes from above. That's why I went in, in Ephesians when it's talking about your life and the spiritual warfare. And it talks about putting on the whole armor of God and having the power of God, and he's your armor and every aspect of that armor is just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That as you just clothe yourself in Jesus in your life and you surrender to Jesus, then you do have authority to stand and pray. You do have authority to rebuke the mountains that are in the way. You do have authority to, to bind the demons that, are, that seem to be affecting your life or your family or your children. You have that right and that privilege. And Satan has to listen when you speak because God has placed that right and that authority and that privilege in your life. But if you don't submit to authority... It's, you can say it all day long, pray it all day long, nothing's going to happen. So I have to come to the place of yielding my heart, my life, my will, my purposes to Jesus Christ. Remember the centurion whose servant was, was sick, or was it his daughter, you know? And he says, you know, Lord, he said, would you come and w would you heal? He kept imploring him to come, and it, it, it was his servant who was paralyzed, I believe. And he kept saying, Lord, would you come? And as he implored him, <clears throat> Jesus said, okay, I'll, I'll go. And he said, oh, you don't even need to come with me. He said, you just speak the words and it'll be done. And he went on to explain what he was saying, because I am a man under authority, and I know that, this is the Joe Armstrong, when Caesar speaks, this centurion responds, and I carry out his word. You're a man of authority. You just speak words. Your will will be carried out by your servants, your angels, your ministering saints, whoever it might be, to carry out God's purpose and will in his life, for, for the life. Jesus said, he marveled. He said, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. What was he marveling about? The statement, you're a man under authority. I'm a man under authority. He walked under the authority of his heavenly father. We walk under the authority of Jesus Christ. And because we're under his authority, I don't have to let the devil beat me up anymore. I don't have to play a little psychological mind games with the enemy anymore. I don't have to let worry destroy my life, and it can, and it's sought to, sought to many times, or stress, things that battle every one of us. But all too often, I think we find ourselves as a, feeling more like a pawn than a powerful prince in the kingdom of God. When he says, I'm submitted, it's the Greek word hupotasso, it means to come under something. I'm, I'm, I'm under the authority of God. And if we can understand that this principle, that all authority comes from above, that God is the ultimate authority, and I, th then I began and I submit to him, I, I think that's first base in understanding God's will. I mean, that's the principle that Paul gives us in, in Romans 13, 1, when he makes that statement. He says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There's no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist, they're appointed by God. God will carry out his will in the world and in, in, in the cosmos. Any way he chooses to do it. Titus puts it this way. Remind the church to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Be ready to do the will of God in your life. But be in submission. 
Peter said, well, you know, you know, the only time we should break that framework of that, the world's authority is when it's contrary to God's authority. He said, do we obey man or do we obey God? The obvious answer is we obey God. But authority, when we begin to understand it, it serves as protection. It serves as guidance. And I think if we understand this dynamic that we're going to experience in our life, this power of changes, when the power of God is in our life, it's because we're submitting to the, the authority of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, and we're allowing the Word of God to have authority in our life. These are all in complete unity as they work in our life, and so we surrender to the Word of God and to the living Word of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And, and as I do that, I respond. So if there's any opposition from the Father, from the Son, from the Holy Spirit, or from the Word, about a decision I'm getting ready to make, what are we going to do? We're not going to do it if God says don't do it. What if God tells us to do something? If there's clear-cut instructions from the Bible to do something, then not. Then do it. Some of us are just guilty of omission. We know what it says. We just don't do it. That's the sin of omission. It's bad as the sin of commission. Amen? We know what to do. But I just want to do it. I know what to want, but I don't want to do that. Anybody ever done any, you know, has anybody ever felt like the Lord was leading to do something and you just didn't want to do it? Am I the only person here? <laughs> Often the Lord has told me about, do this. This is the way you handle this. This is the way you re relate to that person. This is the way you, you respond to this, this issue. And I just didn't really want to do it. Huh? I, just, you know, I just don't think that's my cup of tea. Maybe there's something today you're fighting the Lord on. I'd encourage you to take the stance. Now, when you follow this through, in the home, it talks about authority, amen? There's that family dynamic. Let me, let me break it down a little simpler. For children, you know, growing up, the Bible says you, you honor and obey your parents. I mean, it's the first commandment of the promise. God said so it will be well. What's God saying? I want to bless your life. And if you respond to the authority of it, you can experience my blessing. Right? Always went better for me when I obeyed mama. Didn't go so well when I disobeyed. It didn't go well at all. But what happens when we respond to that authority factor? God does. And then he used it not that a man submits himself to, to, to God. And I know a lot of men want their wife to submit themselves to them. But listen, you know, if you're not submitting yourself to God, you can say submit all you want to, and it won't go very far. He says, wives, you be subject to, to your own husband. Husbands, love your wife. Those are really the same words. He just talked about a mutual submission before that between men and women. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. What's all this submitting stuff? It's getting to a place where God can have power and authority in our life. And as we get to that place where he's, he's moving in our lives and we're submitting to him and to ultimately we're just submitting to his leadership, it, doesn't it say, ladies, as unto the Lord? Well, what if my husband's wrong? God, God's big enough to take care of him. You know, worst thing in my life when Kathy turns me over to Jesus. <laughs> Amen? If you hadn't experienced that, I'll tell her, teach you, have your wife come learn how to pray like that. The church is subject to Christ, the Bible says. We should learn to subject our homes and our families. But you know what? There's a, such a principle there in discovering God's will and our purposes for our life. In fact, the Bible says that if a husband and wife don't learn how to relate to each other properly and biblically, they, their prayers won't even be answered. How can I know God's will if I'm, God's not answering my prayers? Are you with me still? Did, did we get on something a little sensitive there? Because we want our will and we want our way. That's that, that's that family dynamic, but it's all part of the authority. Let me give you one more dynamic here, maybe two. Yeah, you listen. There's the, the counsel dynamic. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 20, verse 18, it says, you know, prepare plans by consultation and make war by wise guidance. You're in a conflict, you need guidance. Sometimes the war can be at your own house. It's amazing how so many people don't want to get counsel. Well, they'll get counsel, you know, from their mechanic, and they'll get counsel from their doctor, and they'll get counsel from their dentist. I mean, and they'll let their doctor and their dentist do even some embarrassing things. Can I get a witness? I mean, y'all have never been to the doctor? <laughs> The older I get, the more embarrassing it gets. I'll leave it at that. But yet, we don't want to let the pastor instruct us. We don't want to let that biblical, godly person that we know give us counsel. We don't let that person we know is walking with Jesus give us counsel. 
Where are we going to get counsel? We're going to go to somebody that will tell us what we want to hear. Well, you're smart enough not to find a doctor like that, aren't you? Hope you're smart enough not to find a pastor like that. Amen? We don't need what we want to hear. We need wise guidance. We know somebody who's familiar with God's ways and God's word and God's will. That's the counsel we, we want to find. That's the place we want to go. Proverbs 24, by wise guidance you will wage war and the abundance of counsel. Abundance, not just one. There's victory in your life. Why? Because you have a teachable spirit. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. We don't. Collectively, we don't know a whole lot. But we know a lot more than the world knows. And we should be getting counsel from godly resources and godly influences. It's the way of the fool is right in his own, wise, his own eyes, but a wise man is the one who will listen to counsel. What are you facing? Well, reach out to somebody. You know a faithful brother, a faithful sister in Christ, a pastor, a teacher, somebody who loves Jesus, then you go to them and say, listen, I'm dealing with this issue. Now, don't go to the church gossip. <laughs> But go to that person you know you can confide in and who has your heart at his interest and your con is concerned about your welfare in your life. And then there's the peace dynamic. has saved my life so many times. The Bible says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. The New English Bible puts it this way. Let Christ's peace be arbitrator in your heart. How many of you watched that Astros game? Home run ball headed for the fence. Red Sox in defense go up. Fans from the other side press the glove, and the ball falls. Somebody says we need to review this. It goes to the arbitrators. It goes to the referee. And I don't care how much you fussed at that call, or I fussed. Anybody see that game I'm talking about? How Tuvi hits the ball, you know, the home run ball. They overturn it. Would have been two runs, three runs. I forgot what it was going to be. Would have won the game. But no way we're going to change that. You know, head manager can come out there, throw his hat on the ground, spit at the ground, stomp, kick dirt, scream, cuss. The referee didn't change his mind. He's the referee. He's the arbitrator. That's the concept this talks about right here. Let the peace of God rule. Let it be the arbitrator in your heart. What does that mean? God will give you a very wonderful, gracious peace if something is his will. But if you start moving away from his will as a child of God, he's going to give you tremendous uneasiness in your spirit. Y'all know what telltale lights are? Warning lights on your car. Years ago, we quit putting a lot of gauges in cars and started putting the warning lights, you know. Check your car or check your engine or check your brakes, those kind of... We, I call them idiot lights. Y'all know what idiot lights are, right? In other words, if the light comes on and you don't do something about it soon, you're an idiot. Because <laughs> it's going to cost you big time. God's given us an idiot light on the heart's dashboard. It's called the Holy Spirit. Now, he's not the idiot. We are, all right? The light's for the idiots. <laughs> we'll be idiotic if we ignore. I can't tell you how many times this has kept me from making a real bad decision. I mean, when everything looked right, I'm going to make this choice, we'll make this decision, you know, and this is the direction we're going to go, uh, this is what we're praying about, and, and just, you know, nothing came together here. Logically, it didn't make a lot of sense, but there was tremendous peace. Or on the other hand, everything made sense here, but there was tremendous uneasiness. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? It's like the Holy Spirit just said, no. No. Now, I can argue with the umpire, the Holy Spirit, and I can, I can resist that, and I can try to logically work my way past that, but the, I've never been able, nor will you, to change God's word or God's will, God's mind. It's not going to happen. And the best thing we can do is hit the brakes and say, I'm not going to, to go forward with this. Then oftentimes, and even in our elders' meetings where we have a decision to make, that's an important decision, that we just have to say, hey, we're not even going to ask for a decision right now. We just want everybody to go take this week or this 10 days, these two weeks, whatever it might be in that regard, and let's just pray about what God wants. 
because I don't want to make a decision based on logic. I want to be based upon the Word of God. Now, many times it's very logical to do God's Word. In fact, the more we grow in Christ, the more we understand what real logic is. Not carnal logic, but spiritual logic. But how often have we made bad mistakes and have I made miserable mistakes because I didn't listen to that peace of God. I didn't let it rule, is the word it used there. I didn't let it arbitrate. I didn't let the Holy Spirit speak to my heart and guide my heart. I just chose to go my own way. The Bible tells us in Colossians, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, it will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, God will use the peace that you have there to protect you and to guard your heart and to guard your mind. God gives us peace. When I'm walking the right way, going the right way, making the right decisions, there's this wonderful grace that serves us well called the peace of God that if I'll pay attention, I'll sense it. But I just need to be sensitive to that and respond. Isn't it amazing that any time you're about to make a bad choice, and those you've been saved for any length of time can, can attest to this, you begin to sense a real uneasiness in your spirit. Proverbs says the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of his being. In other words, the Holy Spirit is in your life, and it's this part where the Holy Spirit gives this dynamic in your life of peace or no peace. Do you have peace about this? Are you uneasy about this? You may have logically all figured out, but something's just not resting right. Maybe you're facing a decision right now. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's with your kids. But you just know something is not right. Then you hold off until you get a word from God, and you move only in the direction that peace is supplied to you, and you walk in that. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your what? Don't lean on what? Your own understanding. That's where peace comes in. That's where grace comes in. So the truth dynamic, it has this dual function in our life. First of all, the function is to, to give us light. It's a lamp. It directs us. It shows us God's will. It reveals God's path before us. All right? But not only give us light, it gives us life in our walk with God. So I'm not only getting direction, with the direction comes this sense of significance and this sense of fullness and this sense of abundance. I, I'm walking with God here. I'm enjoying Christ in my life. I, I, I'm living with, let me put it simpler, I'm living with a clear conscience. I'm not trying to violate God's will and God's word and God's ways, you know. And Paul the apostle said there's power when you learn to live with a pure conscience and live with purity in your heart. There's grace that flows from that. So what do we learn to do? We learn to realize that God is working in my life. I'm not only just having God work in my life, I am participating in the divine nature. The Bible says it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And the words that we, he speaks to us, they're spirit and they're life. So fullness of life. The Bible says God gives us everything that pertains to life. That is the word in the Greek language, Zoe. It talks about eternal life. But understand eternal life that is not experienced after I die. All right? Eternal life begins the moment I give my life to Christ. That moment, I'm an eternal being now. In Christ, I'm fully alive. And now I want to participate in that spiritual life and enjoy that life. And the way I do that is I embrace God's Word. You will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Are you free today? Are you free? Where's the struggle been? I tell people this all the time. Even in my own life, I use this... this this is a good principle for me. It's a good principle for you. That if I'm struggling in some area of my life spiritually, then I, I just need to go to the Bible. Praise God for concordances. I can find about any verse in Scripture in an instant anymore that relates to my situation, my life, my need. I'm not just claiming promises and radically say that was mine. No, God illuminates those promises to me that he wants me to claim for that life. But as I do that, I'm participating in a brand new life and I'm participating in the very nature of God. How about that? You're participating in the very nature. You're walking with your God. You're experiencing God in your life. It's not about trying to, well, God's out there, and I kind of hope I can get everything right. I'm trying to make you happy. Hope it works out. No. God is here with me. God is present with you. God is present in your house, in your home, in your marriage. God is present there. Why don't you involve him? Why don't you partner with him in your life and see what he does in your life? God is using all these dynamics to bring change and good. So not only do we discover what his will is, that sense of significance, we discover, you know, we discover him. 
we discover him. And as we discover him, it's amazing what God will do. I'm not going to give an invitation today, but I'm just going to ask you to bow your head right where you are. Father, we come to you in this moment. You know each and every one of our lives. We present ourselves to you as you see us here in this room. You know our comings, our goings, as the scriptures tell us. There's nothing in our life that's hid from you. Lord, so often we see the light and we're scared of it. There's fear in some regard in our life. I pray you'd help every man and woman and child in this room realize that in that light, they'll discover your love. They'll discover that they really are valuable to you, that they are a workmanship, that poem that you're writing. And you would help them, help me, help us to understand how that we can participate more readily, more eagerly, in the divine nature, you and us, our life is hid with you. God, where there's areas of failure, we've just chosen to be obstinate in regard to truth in your word. I pray our hearts and minds would be open and turn back to truth. We discover our freedom as we yield to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Praise the Lord. I'll tell you about two things that are coming up real quick. One, I want you to be praying for, pray for our upcoming Belize City Rally. I was asked recently, I usually go down to Belize in December, late December, January to discuss our mission trips and our conferences that will be coming up, meet with the regional leaders from, from, the, from the Baptist Association there. They asked me to come in November this year because they're having to bury, uh, for the central district of Belize, which is about 20 churches in that particular district, they're having a joint revival crusade, one night big rally. If you're coming, would you come a month early and preach this crusade and rally? Uh, it's really focused on a fresh new start. And they're praying for revival, basically. And they're spending several days of fasting. They've set aside three specific days in September, October, and November that the churches there are fasting for this meeting and for this conference. They're preparing for, for revival, and they're preparing uh, not only their hearts and their own hearts and lives, but they're inviting as many people as possible. This is a brand-new civic center. Many years ago, we did in the civic center uh, that we took a trip down there and had a group go down there. A band from here went down there, and we used the civic center. And then they tore that old one down and built this new one, and so we, we hadn't got to... Hadn't got to Jesus has it yet, so <laughs> we're going to go in there and preach Jesus and see what God does. Last time we were there, we had like 30-something churches, I think, involved in that crusade that participated from all denominations. So, But be praying for that. Also, uh, Pastor Gary, our campus pastor at uh, Spring Campus, will be going to Uganda to work with some pastors there in Uganda in November 7th through the 17th. So put these two mission trips on, on your prayer list and be praying for, for those that are involved in them. And then as we get into December, latter part of November, December, I'll be sharing with you about the missions objectives for the months to come and the year to come. Amen. So a lot of good stuff's going on at Believer's Fellowship. So just keep praying, keep believing, and see what God's doing. It's exciting to know that we're a part of a church that's reaching outside just the doors of our particular communities, but into the world and being used by God in really dynamic and significant ways. It's a blessing to be a part of it. Amen. And you're a part of it. All right. So you participate, prayer, belief, faith. And uh, let's see what God does. We'll be excited about uh, the results. Amen. Now, we also have a movie night coming up I want to tell you about. In fact, I'm going to do something better if you're ready for that video.